Hey, welcome to church. My name is Brett. I'm the senior pastor of Saints Church in the Edmonton region. And it's an honor and a privilege to have you with us today. We're going to worship together. We're going to study the scriptures. We love you. And I truly believe the best is yet to come. This is going to be an incredible season. So let's lean in and grow deeper in our faith as we follow Jesus one step at a time. Spirit. 
fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Holy anointing, the power of your presence, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Oh, holy anointing, the power of your presence. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. I truly believe the words of Joshua that says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. One of the ways that we serve the Lord and that we serve Him with our whole heart is when we choose to give. You know, Jesus talked about money a lot, and sometimes uh, we're afraid to do it. But what He says, where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. So if you believe in the power of Jesus to transform lives, not only in the Edmonton region, but around the world, would you consider partnering with Saints Church today? as we take care of the spiritual and most basic needs of those who need it in our city, in our neighborhood, and in our communities. We love you. Thanks for being with us today. And thanks for partnering today with Saints Church. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. And oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. And now my soul.
I want to just share with you uh, something from Dr. Ronald Rollheiser. He's actually a Canadian scholar and theologian. This is what he talks about when he talks about forming community. He says, until we reach a certain level of maturity, we form community largely around scapegoating. That is, we overcome our differences and tensions by focusing on someone or something about whom or which we share a common distancing, indignation, ridicule, anger, or jealousy. That is the anthropological function of gossip, and a very important one it is. Think about that for a moment. We overcome our differences intentions by scapegoating someone or something. My friends, can I tell you, that is not the way of Jesus. But the quote continues. He says, that is why it is easier to form community against something rather than around something. And why it is easier to define ourselves more by what we are against than by what we are for. We overcome our differences and tensions by scapegoating someone or something. You come together based on what you're against. This is an us and them mentality. I'm against that person. I'm against that change. I'm against that that elected official. I'm against that pastor or leader. I'm against that father or mother. You know, the kids, my sister and I didn't agree on much, but we could agree that when we needed to get together and cause some change in our family, we could unite our forces for what we thought was good, but most likely was nothing but trouble. Trouble has a way of bringing people together, which is why the church has an identity crisis, because we have for a long time defined ourselves by what we are against, and we struggle to define what we are for. And when we come down to a personal level, we wrestle with the things that we are for. Because it is easier to set ourselves up against something or someone than it is to decide I'm for this. Because when I look in the mirror, I can fight against something almost like a default. But when you ask me what I'm really about, the question is, can you answer? I'm thankful that Jesus didn't think of us in this way. (laughs) Going back to being imitators of Christ, Scripture says that while we were still enemies, this is Romans 5, while we were still enemies, Jesus came at just the right time. Jesus had every right to be against us, this fallen and broken humanity who has walked so far away from his ways. But instead of walking away from us, he leans into us. He becomes Emmanuel, God with us. He builds a relationship while we were still enemies. He was for you before you knew he could be 
against you. Let's, let's shift over to the book of Ephesians because it starts breaking out this idea. This is Ephesians 4. It says, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And then he gets really explicit in what that looks like. But to frame our conversation, let's, dis- let's decide and determine that we are the church that is for people. We are for our neighbor. We're for our community. We're for our family. We are for those who are far away from God. They are not our enemies. They are people that we are called to love. I am for hope and life and freedom and healing. I am for the next generation. I am for A deep encounter with the presence of Jesus. I am for laying my life and my preference and my ideology down at the foot of the cross that I may embrace the way of Jesus. So then he tells us this is how we do it. Buckle up. Come on. This is how we do it. He says, okay, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes because your attitude needs just as much refinement, maybe a little more than your thought. He says, put on your new nature because you're created to be like God. He says, so, this is what that looks like, so stop telling lies. Romans 12 says, be be honest in the evaluation of yourself. Stop telling lies to yourself and stop telling lies to your friends. And he says, let us tell our neighbors the truth. Stop puffing yourself up. Stop building yourself up. Also, stop hiding the truth that Jesus is changing and transforming your life and that you can attribute every form of success that you are living into Jesus Christ. And you can uh, attribute to him every part of forgiveness and grace and mercy to his goodness that you you could say that the reason you're still standing today is because of the faithfulness of God. So stop telling lies and let's start telling our neighbors the truth for we are all parts of the same body. We're all a part of the same body. When you succeed, they succeed. Literally, 1 Corinthians says that when when one part of the body is suffering, so too is the rest of the body. So stop telling lies. Stop saying that you're okay when you're not okay so your neighbor can pray for you. I wonder what would happen if we stopped acting like we had it all together And if we started living like people of faith who were in desperate need of Jesus, that we trusted him with everything and we were honest about our situations and our struggles and our fears. And then he gets really down into it. He says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Ooh, did you notice that there's the word and? He connected the thoughts. So stop telling lies, let us tell our neighbors the truth because we're part of the same bodies and don't sin by letting anger control you. I wonder if we have been hiding from having hard conversations, if we've been hiding for, from forgiveness, from having to forgive our neighbors. I wonder if we've been harboring feelings and we've been allowing anger to control us by not being honest with that person. Now there's a whole process in scripture. Jesus lays it out in Matthew 18 for us to rebuild our relationships. So maybe that love for one another starts with giving an opportunity to forgive and be forgiven. It says, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. He says, deal with it. Don't put it off. Don't, don't push it aside. Don't let it go. Because what happens when you push it aside is you let the roots grow down deep. Hebrews 12 says, don't let that root of bitterness. Can I tell you that root of bitterness starts in the same place with the seed of anger. He says, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. What is the tone of your table? Is it one of grace, mercy, truth, love, life, forgiveness? Or are you a table that is against? You're a table that scapegoats and finds a common enemy. The way of Jesus would call us to love 
one another, to forgive one another, and to follow him forward. And it starts to twist in verse 28. It starts to turn, it says, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good work, then give generously to help others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Come on, what's the tone of your table? Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, and then to another level, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. If you notice, he says, listen, if you steal things, stop doing that, then be generous. It's a redemptive storyline. If, if your words are, are abusive and foul, then start saying good and helpful things, and let your words be used for encouragement. In other words, let your actions and your words and your deeds be multiplied by the goodness of Jesus. Focus on the good things. Invite him into the conversation. Help invite him into your struggle. If you're wrestling with something, he says, listen, just stop doing it and put your hand to something that is good. Commit yourself to something that is good. He's going to take that which was intended for evil, that which the accuser would come and tell you, listen, you're always going to be that way. That's your human nature. But the great news is it doesn't matter what your human nature nature. It doesn't matter if you're born this way. Jesus calls you to be born again and to be transformed. So you just put that thing out of your heart and your mind. You said, you know what? That which was intended for evil, the Lord is going to use for good. If, if my heart is, is, is selfish, then he's going to make me a generous person. The world of the generous, come on, Proverbs 11 gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. If your circle is getting smaller, it could be a heart issue. What's the tone of your table? In the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul doubles down. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, just one final thing. I've got one final thing for you. He says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of of praise. What's the tone of your table? One of my heroes in the faith, Pastor Dick Iverson, he's passed away now, he's in heaven. He says this, he says, when you fall in love with the church, you will treat it different. When you fall in Love with the people in your community, the people in the online chat, the people in your online Zoom group or your in-person small group, the person in your apartment building. When you fall in love with that community, that church, when you fall in love with that, you will treat it differently. You'll fix your thoughts on things that are honorable. You'll say, this is a place of peace. This is a place of mercy and grace. When you fall in love with the church, you will treat it differently. May we rediscover the table as a place of intimacy and connection. May we rediscover the table as a place of intimacy and connection where we don't just share our meals, but where we share our lives. <laughs> well, I, don't, I just need to ask you one more time. What's the tone of your table? What are you for? Who are you for? While we are still enemies, Jesus Christ came at just the right time that he could restore us. Who do you need to restore a relationship with today? Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to reach out to? And you might feel like they need to reach out to you. I wonder what might just happen to your emotional capacity if you just reached out first created a space of love and reconciliation. Come on, he's calling us deeper in this season to fellowship, intimacy, connection, and relationship. Jesus Christ, the King. Come on, we love you, church. 
My name is Brett. I'm the senior pastor of Saints Church. It's an honor that you spent this week with us. You can find us online at saintschurch.ca or you can give us a call if you need prayer or you need someone to talk to you at 587-400-2010. My friends, can I tell you, I truly believe the best is yet to come and together we're going to follow Jesus one step at a time.